Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second part of uh, today's day of the Open Interface Workshop. So for those who don't know me, I'm Robert Schmidt. I work at the Open Air Interface Software Alliance as a 5G RAN engineer, and I'm also involved in the testing efforts in our CI. And apart from that, I do a lot of code reviews and integration. So if the next develop branch doesn't work, then it's probably at least partially my fault. And yes, so, and we will now continue with uh, the talks of the afternoon. So in the beginning, we will have a speaker that we already had at uh, the podium discussion before. So Dinesh Baraja, who is a faculty member of electrical and computer engineering at uh, UCSD here in San Diego. His research interests include designing, prototyping, and deploying next generation wireless communications, wireless sensing, and broad sensors, uh, broad sensors with applications to robotic, AR, VR, health, and everyday life. And in particular, his work, or a lot of his research work, has been translated into startups and commercial products, so Hyla, Kumo Networks, and Tolem uh, Networks, to Totemic Labs, sorry, um, yes. And uh, in the following, he will speak about connecting multi-sensor and science sensors with 5G and wide area networks with multi-domain network connectivity. So please welcome Dinesh. I guess we can start. So uh, I want to actually before acknowledge uh, all the people. There are a lot of people who work on this with me. Uh, so <laughs> There is an extensive UCSD ecosystem on the first line. And this is in collaboration with Shreva Shakotai at Tamu. And we have some folks from ESNet who actually run the entire UE's network, right? Maria is here, we should talk to her as well, right? And this also has some folks from NYU and LDL joining and sort of helping the design. So <laughs> there are three parts to my agenda. First, is a Rick, right? It is a real time Rick, which was sort of considered in the early days of OLAN and was dropped later on, right? I think it's time to talk about that again, right? That's what I want to say. In two objectives, right? One, you want to sort of execute these policies and almost near real time, and it should be very modular and easy to deploy. It. How do we do that? So I'm going to take at least one way of doing it. But I think in the larger conversation we all want to have is how do we do that, right? Now, what we realized with deploying some of these policies within this RT real time metric is that we needed a good digital twin where we can train some of the policies we want to deploy very rapidly on real world equivalent data and sort of show how they translate very well into the digital twin time, right? That's second, right? And third, I will give you an access to interoperability lab. Where basically we have participants from ESNet, NYU, and others helping us out with building this large scale test bed where everybody is welcome to do interoperability tests, right? It will allow you to test against multiple UEs, multiple band stacks, right? And at least that's what we're trying to do, right? And we welcome everyone to join this effort, right? So let's get started, right? So I have already sort of I explained this in the panel. Is that in order to achieve the true gains in the next X generation, right? I see XG, we need to sort of have a KI ML intact well with the RAN stacks, right? <laughs> and what it means is really we need a decoupled framework from RAN to sort of execute KI ML. Right? And this is not like something you are telling, this is already fixed, right? In some sense, right? Okay. So in that context, right, there are two ricks, right? We all know, right? Or we may not, then in that case, there is non-real-time RIC, right? It sort of operates at a very, very slow, granular scale, right? And then there is near real time, which operates at more than 10 millisecond latency, right? And the hypothesis is that these two RICs are not sufficient, right? Okay. And I have some results to explain and why intuitively first, and then give you some actual results, right? So intuitively, this is the graph architecture. Are uh, used connected to the use, right? And then the use connected to the use at much larger scale connectivity, right? Okay. So now on this slide, I show how wireless channel evolves, right? And a lot of these applications from autonomous styling to AR, VR, right, 
have a fast or a stringent requirement of the latency. On the other side, the wireless channel and its mobility is extremely fast. And this means that your RAM has to react to these things, and only if it can react to these things, it can give you true potential of this connectivity. Right? And this, the 10 millisecond delay, will affect and will not be able to keep up. Right? And therefore, you need a RIC sort of sitting next to your RAM, right? or a very last mile of the RAM. So, this is what our proposal is in the CRX, right? Okay. To co locate this edge, I call this RT edge, right? It's edge because it sits next to the edge. And this is where also the previous proposal which was inspired, right? And then, by no means, I'm not saying that this is, I think we need to rediscuss this, right? We had these proposals, right? Without clear value proposition, right? Okay. And I'm going to give you that value proposition as well, right? So what it allows you to have a stack, which essentially is parallel to me, is that you could essentially execute policies in near real time and react to the channel, right? Which is really generally hard to react to Okay. So in that context, let me give you one line of point, right? This is a video streaming application. What is the complete message? The complete message is that by using Real time EJIC, we get half the number of stalls in video streaming compared to a near real time EJIC. Okay. And I can explain you this plot in great detail. The thing we need to sort of see is that there is a mobility as well in the channel, right? Small, medium, high, and sort of showing the performance compared to this is the near real time, right? You see 600 stalls here and it's 300 drop to this in the EJIC, right? Okay. So now, not spending too much time, I just want to give you this detail in, later on in careful depth, right? But this shows that we need this to react to the wireless environment, right? Fast enough. Okay. All right, let's look at our architecture now, right? So, this is our typical ORU, CU, DU architecture with core, which essentially has a E2 interface. I'm not sure E2 asset, but basically, this is where you sort of have. On the cloud end, you have the edge rig, right? Or sorry, the cloud rig, which are the near real time rig and non real time rig. And this is our real time edge rig, which sort of sits next to parallel at the edge to the team. Right? And it sort of goes to these real time exchange of information and also has some information coming from near real time rig and non real time rig. Right? So the key point is that it sits at the edge and we call it these as micro apps. The reason we because it reacts and can react at things at microsecond scales, right? Instead of sort of reacting at tens of millisecond scales, right? Okay. And I mean, the one thing which I would say is that uh, this runs very nicely with all the tools, and this is an all mode life, right? Let me take a look at how this works, right? So here is a more detailed diagram and then zoomed in view, right? Okay. So we have open AI gen, so you can run any AI policies from in near real time at the very edge by taking all these inputs, right? Remember, the app state is actually not directly flowing it, but it's flowing it from the near real time rate back to this, right? And app states are not evolving that fast. But a lot of the RAM state is immediately available for the edge rate or RT edge rate to react to it, right? And this then also can invoke open AIJ on the other side, right? So you can run real time RF policies, right? And as somebody said, right, we did all of this plumbing in this stack, right? I won't go into detail of the exact plumbing, right? And integration effort, right? And figured out how to get this done in a really fast way, right? And there was a RTAJ has always had this problem where, like, can you execute all these things in near real time where you can get the state? compute things and then react back and provide this information back to the stack, right? So this is how it works at a very simple example level, right? So near RT RIC, right, which is in the cloud, chooses a policy, an RL policy, let's say, and it sends that policy down to RT edge, right? Once that policy is instantiated, that policy then is in real time, computed on the RAM states, right? And then the actions are provided back to the RAM states, right? 
and these actions are in the form of abstraction of weights, right? Land stack just does a simple thing. It continuously runs a proportionally fairness scheme, right? And you have multi-year proportionally fairness, right? What it does is it then continuously allocates resource block with this weight abstraction. Now, what is beauty is that weights, we have or I've seen in our results, can achieve any sort of RL algorithm you want to build with an abstraction of weights. Okay. And this weights create a clean cut between the, the RAM and the brick, right, at the PU level, right, or at the RT rate level. Now, I'll show you in more details, right? So now let me go over some of the myths which people have had in the past, right? Can you execute things in less than a millisecond, right? Okay. So this is on the left side, and we train an RL. I'm not going to tell you about RL. Right? Assume you have some interesting cool RL, right? And the most complex RL. This is vector index based RL policy, right? And we train it and we show. In inference time, its computation are less than 0.2 milliseconds, right? And this is again running all of this cutting through the CPU, going into GPU, computing it up, and then getting it back, right? Okay. Actually, interestingly, what we found is that the other policies are like not complex networks to run, like CNNs and others, right? And often enough, you can, even if you wanted to run in CPU, you would be fine. So, but open AI is even great and cool, so we sort of had this interaction in that context, right? And that was a surprising result we found. But it is beyond that, what we figured out is also that the entire RAN and back to the RIC, entire RTT, including the compute time, took less than a millisecond for most cases, right? And we had to do a lot of engineering to get to it, but we are able to do it, right? It's actually feasible, right? And soon, few months, we'll have this code base available for you all to play with, right? And the only thing I have is perhaps we'll be able to soon enough support even OEI with this. Uh, with us. I know it's a sad sign, but uh, it was easier for us to do in the, when the time we started one year about this. Anyways, so the point I want to say is that entire compute communication back and forth, ran to it, achieved in less than one millisecond, which is a PTI for at least. <coughs> The current generation of FR1. Now I will show you that this line actually doesn't scale that badly. So if I had one UD versus if I had 100 UD, and remember these are like 100 users which are concurrently being supported by the RAM. You can have 10,000 users, but in one API, you wouldn't support more than 100 users. So this is the absolute, absolute best case you sort of want to imagine, like a worst case pattern, right? And we take 50 microseconds to share the state from the RAM to the edge. Okay. And this doesn't scale, like it's very, very reasonable, right? And then I'm showing even that as a number of user scales, how it's on x axis to y axis, you can see it's like 50 or 40 microseconds is the best. And this is like a decent size number, not even a server, very well optimized server in terms. So now let me explain how we evaluated this with an advanced stack, right? So we took a lot of real-world measurements, CQIs, right, and synthetic CQIs, right? And we created our own environment where we instantiate one UE in this example, right? Okay, and we, I think this is also supported by SRN SRN based stack, right? But then we sort of scale this to multi UE, right? And here is our sort of environment for evaluation, right? You get the CQI trace, which is space for each SRS UE, right? And you sort of create IQ samples for each one of them, and then client state sort of goes through the data logger and comes to the RT edge. And this RAM essentially is queried to give these specific information, literally read out the information CD, and then the information given by the RT edge is just a scheduling grid. Okay. And with this, we actually show 20% improvement in the Right, and this is a very high mobility scenario, right? I mean, I have to acknowledge that this is a more simulated one scenario, right? Then um, the the one which would be a real world, right? And I'd go to the real world soon enough. But we show five megabits of improvement in the RTH throughput compared to the 30 millisecond near RTH, right? Which is actually a very typical number, right? Then as we increase
increase the number of users, this only keeps improving. And I'll show you later results with real world channels as well. Right? So, this, and this is when we sort of had a policy, it was trained on stability data and it worked well on stability data. Right? But when we actually took this policy and tried to run it in real world data, it didn't work well. Right? And this is where we realized that there is a gap. right? And more conveniently and more interestingly, and this is a concept which everybody said. I'll make two concrete points in digital science, right? First, how do we obtain data, right? And again, you can use all these tools out there, right? You can do your own deployment, collect a lot of other data, and then use that data and plug into this framework, right? Here are two problems with this data interaction. The space continuity and time continuity are not there. So let me explain. If you take a PGTP channel model today, what happens is that in that channel model, right? The Doppler suddenly changes after each transient, right? Okay. So what you are really have is that you have a channel which is essentially like user is moving from here to here, then suddenly in that next time is it jump from here to here, right? Okay, without any context of how this jump happened. And this creates a real problem for RL models to train against, right? So Consistently, what we realized is that simple thing like space and time continuity didn't exist in a lot of past work, right? And so we had to invoke the space and time continuity, and they created our own sort of channel model, and also used something called wireless inside to create the channel model, right? I think a lot of people probably know of this, right? It's just a simple tool where you can instantiate the entire building, then it creates certain channels. Right? These are not that realistic, but they are decently good, right? Better than what I had previously. Right? They have space and time continuity. The idea is to instantiate the environment, get channels, but maintain the continuity as the time progresses. And maintaining continuity is extremely hard to all because you can't have every microsecond change your channel and then keep instantiating and apply for each sample and get a new channel as well. Right? So, how do you sort of keep scaling to that? Right? And we have a way to do it. But let me know this. This was the first problem we faced, right? Second, I think the interesting thing is that we had this already done, right? We took a lot of real world measurements and put those in to train our RL, right? Okay. Those also work fantastically well. And we also have FR1 and FR2 data set we train on both as well, right? To see if the RL can be trained really well. And this is our showing the 28 gigahertz millimeter wave test, right? A lot of the data collected here is also available online, and you guys can also play on it, right? Use it as we see. It provides you with a key ingredient, which is space and time continuity, right? Which I think you won't find in some of the data, right? but some many of them have it, right? Okay. So now I think I can skip this slide. So now you can have a channel which either can come from real world data collect or from virus inside, and then you can apply this simulated channel and run the simulation. Right. So, what does the simulation framework do? There are two things it does. Right. Since the channel is under my control, right. Here's what I can do. I can instantiate a base station, and I can instantiate many units. And these units can be of different server, different namespaces as you want. Right. The interconnect between them is a simple ZN2 based interconnect. Right. And what is great about this is that it can run ten times faster than actual environment can, right? Because it's simulation, right? A TPI can actually in a millisecond, it can complete in point one millisecond, and you can play other courses really, really fast. Okay, this is the third key property of my digital twin, or at least the one I'm presenting to, right? <laughs> and we instantiated this in the rain, this rain, the whole ecosystem of distributed computer problem, right? And fantastic people we have here right now who has helped us get this going, right? And you can apply different channels as you see fit and different noise, AWGN, and so on and so forth, right? Again, with space time continuity. Now, in this case, we see similar, I guess, 8 megabits improvement. This is four user case with uh, four different mobility, and this is a total code as we see in the RAN stack, right? Again, I'm just repeating this for all the results, right? And then we ran a video stream on all of these four users, and we got these 300 stalls uh, instead of 600 stalls, right? Okay. So, I think there are many more use cases I can demonstrate where edge rate will do extremely well compared to near real time rate. And this is a conversation we should start having now, right? And start engaging in the next generation to have this improvement. 
Now, I'm going to keep on a few more applications RT exec can do really well. Right? One thing I will tell you about is this. Okay, This is what I call a sensing communication. So, Viola has been doing this spectrum sensing for like a long time. right? We have up to $10 million funding in sort of doing spectrum sensing for different variety of DOD and SF efforts. Right? Uh, so, here's what our architecture was. right? So the architecture was previously people used to do this, right? They used to scan one band, sit on it, and then change the frequency, go to the next band, scan it, right? And they get information. This was a very slow way of collecting information. We came up with this new architecture which rapidly seeks the spectrum, right? And what happens if you see rapidly the spectrum? You get a very small amount of chunk of data for each signal, right? And you use that small chunk of data to do Below noise source signal detection and characterization again, power of AI ML right, combined together. And what it gives us that now we have a fabric which is a spread sensor, it's a wide band sensor. You can deploy multiple of these wide band sensors and it can be co located with your ORAN RU, it can be co located with your EU and whatnot. And the entire fabric can then power your sensing driven communication. Right? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, this would be space time sensing to enable global view of spectrum, and you can use this information in time together with the ORAN stack. Right? And this is something we are pursuing very strongly in terms of, right? As I said, we have to use the 10 million DMAs. Okay, so moving on. Now I'm going to transition, and this is primarily work done by some of the other folks at UCSD, right? I'm just helping them out with my 5G expertise, right? So they run something called ESNet. ESNet is Department of Energy, which is Network for Science. This is the best network out there. Right? If you want to run your science experiments today, that's where you want to go there and do it. Because they have a research network which you can run real experiments on. They connect all the way from UCSD West Coast to the East Coast. Right? Okay. All right. So what can you do there? So here is the salt NRP. Okay. National Research Platform. Uh, platform. It's an internet tool based, right? And it connects all the science applications as you can see here, right? And there is one link at UCSD which sort of connects to everything out there, right? I'm going to go over some of the racks and capabilities of some of the other facilities. There is the University of Nebraska Lincoln. They have extensive amount of compute on FPGAs and so on and so forth. And if you want, you can go to the other places, right? This is what we have at UCSD. Extensive amount of compute, storage, GPU, as many things as you want. And then what I want is that we are right now doing, and this is a network switch diagram, and this is actually rigorously maintained network switch, right? So it supports people if you want to do all the SDRAM related research, right? Fantastic facility to do it, right? And this now is coming to 5G. Right? I was sort of saying that we are bringing this to 5G now. And the idea really is this. So my lab has an extensive number of SDRs, right? We connected those SDRs to this network. It's a Kubernetes-based network, right? And we are trying to already have the 5G core running and sort of connecting multiple G nodes across UCSD and NYU, right? And all of this running right now for OEI, right? With a lot of the nice toolkits, right? We are also trying to use Dialix T1, T2. Offloading and sort of setting this network up. We just got the pins to work. So we are just there. We should have soon this network up and running and doing high throughput demos, right? So, and this is the facility which is connects to, right? We have the square, 2200 square foot, many, many SDRs connected to many different types of antennas. These are very broadband antennas. You can make at any frequencies you want customizable base stations, okay? And this is a complex networking diagram, and what we are hoping we'll support right on this application, right? All the way from spectrum sensing to virtual reality and regular sensing as well, right? Okay. And on the other side, we are also connected to NYU, and NYU is going to bring us OIU, and we are going to do a multi-domain band connecting UCSD to NYU in some sense. And it does support hand charts and they will do a lot of interesting stuff which makes it easy to deploy all these things. Okay. So really fast, right? But this is the concrete part, right? It's multi-domain networking with 5D. Okay. And I'm gonna probably just go over 
Uh, I think this other idea is another thing you can do here, right? I've already deployed a lot of cameras, radiation sensor, all the way and you can get all their data, right? So I'm going to pause at that and take questions more than that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we need to time. Sure, fuck Yeah. Good. I'll repeat this question as well. Yeah. Except, just wondering, in general, for the the kind of decisions that can benefit from, like, start from the second. I mean, decision that I want to cut the real time um, how, how is the, this leak based architecture, leak based architecture, like, you know, fundamentally more powerful than what, how that you bring in the decision of the language in the general? So, the most simplest thing I can think of, and whenever it comes to wireless, is online coding, right? The channel is so rapid. The reason why they're getting all these benefits, right? If you think about it, right? Our application state is equally delayed, right? And the thing is, we have immediate access to is the wireless channel and it's reactive, right? So the one first thing I can tell you is that it can react to very, very fast wireless channel changes, right? And use that to decide these things, right? And this will be clear, right? I'm not saying it's some millisecond at this point in time, right? It is like, even if it is two millisecond, it's actually a lot better than. What a 20 millisecond or a 30 millisecond overhead can do, right? Yeah. Even if, like, let me give you an example firstly, right? Sometimes what we notice is that you sort of send a RAM a state, the compute for some weird reason comes by in the next CDI cycle, right? If we put not in the CDI cycle, even that is fine because it's still far more usable than the information which is 20, 30 millisecond delay because already it's like, 20 channel, 20 uh, KDI below uh, or delayed information, right? So it's far, far more effective in that, right? Now let's come to the application on the other side, right? At least what I, I haven't, I have to say, we are evaluated on video streaming right now. <laughs> but even video streaming, if your channels is really bad and sort of like once it it's hard to scenario, and we saw this like good improvement, right? Now, if you can think of applications or the think of applications of Maybe I will invoke the word metaverse again, right? But AR, VR, even HoloLens type of application where you need a uh, visually responsive response, right? Like even VR requires 10 milliseconds, right? But 10 milliseconds is end to end for VR, right? So network has to be reactive some millisecond in that reactive, right? Other 9 milliseconds is for fetching content and all the other processing which other wants, computer wants to do as well, right? So I see those are the cases where Tony this has a lot of uh, usefulness. The other is uh, the self-driving ecosystem. It becomes if you for transmission sensing out of the car into the network, right? Then this becomes a very critical thing where you have to deliver these in the ten millisecond uh, reaction to the question. I can repeat your question. Oh, sorry, project, I didn't see that. Yeah, so, so thanks, thanks for your question. I, um, you know, the, the, the small performance is different than the long time ago, like 4G, I believe it is to actually do um, this interface where you can, um, uh, the network where you can, can um, change your scheduler, yes, you, you can plug in your, um, your own schedule. So I was wondering, um, no, no, given that, um, how does it work with this this edge rate is related to that? So so would it be what's the advantage? Would it be equivalent to, to also just change the scheduler? Or or what was the added value of the of the of the this real time rig? So good question, right? So the the one thing which you said on the standardization where you can replace the scheduler, right? There is a lot of high bound on the schedulers to meet. Right. Okay. In this framework, right, if your RF policies are not able to even meet those five forms, right, it doesn't break the system or breaks the system altogether. It's decoupled, right? So the reason because of its decoupling, it will use the weights from the previous instance or whatever best it chooses at that point in time, right? With the philosophy of what you were saying, right? I think actually I actually am curious on that side on the is there a 
that we have tried coding our schedules many times to many of these different companies in local we have been working with. And we have realized that nobody wants you to let these things touch, right? <laughs> okay. One thing is like one standardizes, and one thing is what sort of gets, I guess, executed, right? So this allows you to even break the system and still don't break the actual Ryan stack. It will break the Rick stack if it out, right? And you can reboot that if you want to. <laughs> And you can have more than one millisecond late ADI as well, right? So we had this early on um, policy, which basically was taking a lot more time to compute for some uh, weird reason because we had overloaded the server and somebody else was running a parallel compute on this, right? Okay. And we realized that it took more than a DTI for the response to come back, right? And it, this was taking uh, the policies had to be retrained with one flag delay, right? Or we had retrained it. And it worked perfectly. One TTI delay is also not like horribly bad. It's one millisecond. So, like, still far better than 20, 30 minutes. Right. So we have this first question up here. Yes. And then the bottom. Okay. Good project. So thank you. Thanks, Yash. Uh, excellent topic. And since you're so good at passing multiple questions, I will ask you to. <laughs> so, could you walk me through a use case where you have your system on your side and the FIU system on their side? Maybe you can't hand off, perhaps you can do something like that. If the code is running somewhere else and, and you are here. So, can you walk me through a compelling use case as to why this cross continental connection is vital to, uh, to the success of the environment? So, actually, I think. The way at least I think about the ESNet, and I like these guys and what they're doing. So they're like, we wrote this long ago proposal and it never got to, but the idea was basically I want to do therapy across the country. For some reason, I have a really good therapist in New York, right? And it wants to be felt as if an interactive experience with that therapist, right? On this side, right? <laughs> And there was a colleague who was doing this, right? And he's like, I need this type of latency, can you deliver it, right? And we did a lot of experiments and we realized that you can't use internet. At least internet 1.0 internet we all use, it's not usable in this sort of experiment, right? And then somehow I found that UCSD has the ESNet connection, right? And these guys know really how to cut down the network latency, right? And they showed me at least, <laughs> On the science network, extremely, extremely good latency, right? Literally, there are like, like literally, I think the best thing is to show you is for right? This switch diagram yeah. I showed you on one slide, right? This is the best thing you can think of, right? Um, this shows, and Mariam can answer this question really well. Uh, this is the diagram, right? Literally, this is exactly the configuration of all the north and the south. Region, right? You can see exactly the number of hops here we made. To get to that other one, right? So now my point is that a lot of the telemedicine and the other use cases we have been thinking, right? I think we can evaluate this across this cross country test, right? And I welcome you to join this, right? And I think the only thing you need to do on your end is somehow figure out to get on the research RNA network, right? Okay, which most universities have actually, they don't even realize. Interestingly, what I've told, and Malik can add to this better, right? Is that NYU had 400 gigabyte link, right? And coming to their servers, and we like talked to them a couple of times and figured out, hey, you have this fantastic thing going on, right? To DOE, right? Can we send, send you some base stations which will be running 5G, right? And we'll establish a very, very nice uh, connectivity, end to end connectivity, right? Like if somebody has a hollow lens on both sides, they can interact nicely with each other and try some experiments out on that, right? And that is actually something we can do really well with this. Right? Hopefully, I only answer your first question. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank So, my question is more about technical. When you do the kind of animation simulation of the do you actually consider handover the back to the kind of handover that you can sell? Right. And the question is when you have a patch rig, maybe. That's exactly your next project, right? Thank you for making that question, right? I think the next thing I want to answer is this, right? Whenever I've given this talk, some of the people have caught on to this, right? Is that, look, 
the number of RUs which connect to one DU can be tightly covered, right? Okay. But if there is one more pop of the DU, right? I have to couple across these for handovers or some of these things, right? Then all the things I have done, right? I'm not sure how well they will scale from multiple DU, right? And it's on our current trajectory. So I have some initial answers, but right now. Yeah, so the next second question is also a little bit closer to our interest. Is model training very movie or the actual training? I'm trying to write this question because it changes the way all of them are as high away that you could have problems. So, yes, I think it's training sort of uh, for all movies, a single RL policy is with training, right? And at this point, but you can train per unit the policies and try to execute, right? Because here's how you should think of it, right? Each U is information. I show you this plot where it sort of scales to 100 U, right? Each U is information is parallelly gone to the the edge. Rate. If edge has enough compute, where it can compute things and then turn around, right? You can have per U based RL model. Right? But right now, you mostly the results I showed you with a single RL model. <laughs> Good point, right? And I think I call it more broadly. Like these days, a lot of people are doing edge research, right? They look into these issues of sharing the state of the edge altogether across different edges, right? And how do you sort of take that? Right? I think that's how I see the DU problem, multiple DU problems can be nicely thought about. Think of uh, you have a many seats, right? And then sorry, I will probably pause here and head them back. And but we can discuss this later on. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dinesh, for this interesting presentation.